Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, having gone through a whole day of uh, discussion on education and the future of Penang, we have now come to the last session, and we have to stop sharp 4.30 for YB Dato Abdul Halim to have his closing address. Therefore, I would request all our presenters to do the presse of whatever you want to say so that we can stop at 4.30. So our session is back to basics. What Penang has always been known for, culture and uh, arts and then the food and the tourism, which is always Penang has been well known for this. So having gone through all the digitalization, education, etc., industrialization, now we come to what Penang has always been known for since the British time. It was a straight settlement. So because of the time constraint, I will mute myself and ask YB Yo to give his first presentation on the tourism. And I'm not going to introduce the speakers also for a short of time. Thank you. YB, the floor is yours. You want to be there or here? Good afternoon. Yeah, thank you, the moderator, and also the panelists, and ladies and gentlemen. Uh, good afternoon. So as we embark on the last quarter of year 2021, we see that Malaysia is still begging the war against COVID-19 pandemic. Despite outpacing many countries that we are now one of the fastest country in the world in vaccination, but I still perceive that there are still many uncertainties at this point of time. Ever since COVID-19 coronavirus attacked the whole world and also Malaysia in year 2020, even probably earlier in year 2019, the tourism and also creative industry were amongst the first to hit and also the last to reopen, as what we have seen. So in, on this note, it's fair to comment that tourism and also creative industry are the most unfortunate sectors impacted by pandemic COVID-19. When facing the pandemic, the government, either federal or the state, even the government in the whole entire world, the responses by the government were mostly centered on the balancing the trade-off between life and livelihood. So we see that many economies of the state or countries that heavily dependent on tourism or hospitality sector are badly affected by this merciless pandemic. And this is because everything has been practically grounded to a standstill. The international border has been closed. So when we talk about economy of Penang, we cannot exclude tourism. Tourism is indeed a very important sector within the service sector that contributes most of the GDP to the state of Penang before pandemic. And also, it's a very significant source of employment and also businesses to the Penang state, especially for the SMEs. And we see that service sector contribute 49% of the state GDP had emerged at the top economic sector to the state. I, I believe that if without the COVID-19 pandemic, year 2020 should be a very interesting, amazing, and also booming year for the tourism sector. But due to unwarranted pandemic, everything has been halted. Nevertheless, this unwarranted pandemic has also given us unprecedented lessons and also give us an opportunity to rethink our perception, our vision, our plan for our tourism in future. The Spain state government recognizes the pandemic is a timely opportunity for us to rethink 
our tourism and also a timely opportunity for us to propel the development in arts, culture and heritage sectors that explain the debut of a creative economy portfolio in September last year, when our, our Chief Minister announced the reshuffles of our ESCO portfolios. So to put it in a better context, we seek to benefit from our culture and heritage by redriving their economic value to create employment and also economic opportunities without compromising the integrity and also identity of our local culture and also our heritage. With art, culture and heritage now integrated into one big umbrella, creative economy, what we aim is to have a better synergy between tourism and also creative industry that both are important pillars to bolster and also to support our state economy in the post-pandemic era. But before that, I would like to emphasize that to have a successful reset and also revitalization of any industry, we require a proper and also meticulous planning and also a good and sound three Ps. What is three Ps? Public, private and people partnership as well as far-sighted vision. And the state school entrusted with the mandate to spearhead the tourism and also creative industry. It's my primary duty to place these two sectors out of the economic low drum. As a result, the fire strategy, the fire strategy is retain, reset, recover, rebrand, and also restart. What's employed to accelerate the rebound of our tourism and also our creative industry? Retain. What should we retain? According to the international study and so research about the tourism in the post-pandemic era, now trust is cited as a core element in the tourism industry. So based on this foundation, we have to retain our tourism roadmap, and we concluded that trust is a new currency. This has inspired the statewide responsible tourism campaign that we aim to restore regain the trust and confidence among our travelers by educating every party, all parties, regarding their respective roles in making Penang is a safe and also responsible destination. So we introduced guidelines of reactivation of tourism activities to educate our tourism operators and also our choice about their fundamental obligations in complying with the SOPs to make sure that we can reduce the risk of virus transmission. Knowing well the abnormal now is a new normal, so we want to inculcate people about and also to embrace many practices that we never practiced before. So to make sure that safety and also hygiene are now the indispensable elements to our tourism industry. So we are not only selling the products, we are not selling the food, we are not selling the, our beaches, or our hills, or our, or our uh, theme park. We also want to sell our safety and also hygiene compliance to our choice. So that's what we really think that we need to do in the post-pandemic era. So next up is to reset. So on this note, the integration of arts, culture and heritage sector into creative economy portfolio is also a mechanism for us to preserve and also to conserve our Penang's unique uh, culture and also heritage. This is because creative economy encourages a greater form of expression and also to increase civic participation that can break boundaries and also to promote better accessibility. 
And I'm proud to say that Penang is the first state in Malaysia to introduce the creative economy portfolio that to integrate arts, culture, and heritage into together one big umbrella. So we want to reset the people mindset and also people perception about arts, culture, and heritage that arts, culture, and heritage is not just to remain as a tradition without any money or without any economic value. So we want to endow economic value to cultural and heritage to reset people thinking that we, we can un unlock and also to unleash the economic value of our arts, culture, and heritage so that we can to encourage our young people to participate, to contribute into arts and culture practices. And I believe that Penang, we have so many good talents in the sector of arts and culture and even heritage. So we have a very good and also powerful potential to make culture and heritage as a new emerging economy generator by exploiting human creativity and also innovative under the big umbrella of creative economy, like what we've seen in Europe countries like UK, Hong Kong, Singapore, Bangkok. They are using art and cultural heritage as an economic gender for the state or for the nations. And I see that the pandemic had also expedited the migration of traditional traders and also businesses into digital form. So we, we need to call for a new efforts to be made, to motivate, to encourage young people in Penang, even outside Penang, to import new technologies, arts media, and even marketing channels for us to build, uh, for us to have a cultural renaissance in the state of Penang. Then we go, after we retain, reset, we need to recover. We need to buffer the impact and effect suffered by the industry players during the pandemic. So in order to deflect the further devastating uh, impact caused by the pandemic, we have tried, I mean, I mean the state government have tried our best to provide whatever financial assistance within our parameter to ease the cash flow of the industry players to overcome their economic backwater. In Penang, we provided targeted aid packages like zero interest loan, moratorium to quick rents, to assessment, to water bills, to hotel fees, licensing fees, any whatever fees and payment that within our jurisdiction, as well as one-off financial assistance to the vulnerable groups. So despite the limited resources, the government of the state has, we did our best to mitigate the impact and also to support our tourism players and also our arts, culture and heritage practices, practitioners, because they are the most affected during this pandemic. Through the responsible tourism, uh, sorry. So the fourth R is rebrand. Rebrand actually is a branding exercise. And I'm proud to say that Penang is also the first state to introduce COVID-19 safety accreditation program during the pandemic to score the label as a responsible destination. This safety accreditation program is a branding exercise to position Penang as a health protocol compliance state that does not compromise or tolerate any incompliance of the safety and hygiene or even the SOP. Under this program, the tourism operators like hoteliers, like tourist attractions, shopping malls, can choose to participate where authorities like health department, local council, Penang Global Tourism will carry out a tariff audit to ensure that the standards are complied with before validating them to receive the COVID-19 safety certification. Through the responsible tourism concept, we seek to facilitate the smooth public transmission from a pandemic to endemic. We need to keep on reminding all parties that public health and safety are all paramount significance. So we could reduce risk of virus transmission and importantly embrace tourism in a responsible manner. 
Penang is well known as one of the top tourism des destinations in Malaysia that offers diversified products all over island and also mainland in our Subang pride. The state has abundant cultural and heritage resources, well-known street food, natural-based offerings, beaches, resorts, medical tourism. And recently, there's also increased demand in mice activity and also cruise tourism. And latest, with the inscription of Penang Hill as a UNESCO Biosphere Reserve status, Penang now we have we are the only state in peninsula of Malaysia. We have two UNESCO status, so we can foresee and also anticipate that there will be influx of tourists after the reopening of the international borders. So, nevertheless, Penang has still has many natural reserves and green spaces that are still undeveloped, especially tourism products in Subang Pride, are still undiscovered or not well promoted, I, have, I need to admit. That is why in, the, in my Penang Tourism Master Plan, we emphasize the importance to have more balanced development in terms of tourism products between both islands and also Subang Pride. We want to ensure that the tourism is sustainable by developing products that would benefit the society at large and also create positive impacts on our local economy to our local community. So, in conclusion, ever since the pandemic outbreak, we understood that the tourism and creative industry, comprised of arts, culture, heritage, will share a strong, very strong interdependency. And we believe in a sustainable and resilient approach. As we explore the transition into an endemic phase from pandemic, we need to bear in mind a few fundamental principles, which I personally refer them as three S, self-prevention, self-preservation, and also self-discipline. These three S work together with five R. Both of them, three S and five R, are important factors in ensuring sustainable recovery of our tourism economy and also creative industry in the post-pandemic era. As a summary, Penang tourism needs to be elevated by introducing a new level of services, infusing the essence of new technologies while we try to maintain the authenticity of the local culture and also heritage. I assure that we will work closely with all the stakeholders to build resilience and also to build endurance of the industry, so and we will focus on nature and culture in our tourism agenda for the coming maybe five years or ten years, and what's stated in our tourism master plan. So with that, I want to say thank you, and um, we hope that the tourism, which is an important sector for the state economy, will be rebound quickly as soon as possible. Thank you very much. Thank you, YBO, and we wish you all the best in re reviving and revitalizing the new norm in tourism. Penang was really getting a very good name for creative arts and tourism because I have personally brought several of my foreign friends to Penang, and the normal uh, uh, itinerary is to, I will drive them personally from KL to Penang so that they enjoy the North-South Highway two or three days in this hotel and then we visit all the heritage areas and they really appreciated Penang and they said this is much, much better than Kuala Lumpur because this is where there is life. And unfortunately, the COVID has sort of put a temporary stop and let's hope we will revive this. Next in our speaker's uh, agenda is uh, Dr. Matt, who is from Think City, Dr. Matt Benson, who has uh, done a great job. Uh, Think City has collaborated very well with the state to develop the heritage areas of Penang. Okay, thank you very much, um, and thank you for the organizers.
for arranging this very important session today um, on revitalizing and resetting culture, heritage, and tourism in Penang. So yes, I am from Think City. We're an urban regeneration organization. We were set up in 2009, just shortly after uh, Georgetown was listed as a, as a World Heritage Site. Um, and with a grant from the Ministry of Finance, we uh, embarked on something called the Georgetown Grants Program. And working with the state and other agencies, we were able to make a positive contribution um, to the revitalization and regeneration of Georgetown. But I'd, I'd like to make the initial point that we, we never saw it as heritage to be preserved, right? That was not our purpose. We never saw it as a commodity that should be um, commercialized for consumption by tourists. That's not the way we saw it. We saw the heritage value as an enabler of something larger, an enabler of economic development, an enabler of sustainable development, if you like. And if you look at the literature, um, UNESCO and other parts uh, at the minute, this is what they argue, yeah? How do you use heritage not as something to be protected, not as a tool, but as an enabler for something larger. So that was, early days, that was a, a part of our, our approach. And if we think about this in economic terms, uh, this could be, for example, if you invest in, and we've just heard some commentary here from Datto about his friends from Kale, if you make your, uh, your cities interesting and livable, you attract talent, you attract investment. Yeah? So this is just a small example of how heritage can enable something much larger. Uh, one of the first things that Think City did when it was set up in 2009 was it undertook a baseline assessment, a census of the heritage site, yeah? 5,000 5, odd buildings. We surveyed every single house, every single business, every street stall, etc. And we just completed our third census of the heritage site and YB will be helping us launch an atlas of change um, in, in a couple of weeks. But I'm just going to read out some data for you from that data. Yeah? Um, this is, so this is between 2009 just after UNESCO listing to 2019, just, just before COVID hit, sir. So we get this nice bit of data about Georgetown. 2009, the number of hotels was 61. 2019, 177, yeah? so nearly tripling. Number of hotel rooms, 2,246. The end of 2019, 5,571. The data here is a bit sketchy in terms of the actual number of tourists, but you know it, it's definitely it could have gone anything from a little under a little over four million to perhaps a little over seven million in that period of time. This is to Penang as a whole, eh? not just the heritage site. Um, the number of restaurant and bars, 300 to over 500. 2,300 new businesses established in that period of time. The daytime population up from 38,000 to 47,000. This is just for the heritage site. This is important. The nighttime economy slightly increased from 16 to 8,000. This includes tourists and visitors. And we estimate that over a third of the building stockers had some form of intervention. Huh? So these are significant investments in cultural and heritage. Huh? So this data, it, it book, uh, you use the word bookends, huh? it bookends a remarkable period in Georgetown's history. Huh? The time just before UNESCO listing and the time just before COVID. Huh? Uh, so what we have seen though is that one set of vulnerabilities, i.e. the vulnerability of disinvestment in heritage, being resolved but kind of being replaced with a new set of vulnerabilities. And I think we can all agree that COVID has shed some light on those. So let me just quickly go through those and then I propose some potential solutions. Huh? So the first big vulnerability that, that has occurred in the heritage site, and this is what happens anywhere in the world, it's not being specific with gentrification, is the resident population has gone from a little over 10,000 to a little under 7,000, nearly a decline of nearly a third. And that's a vulnerability because, as we've seen during COVID, Georgetown streets were pretty much empty, but you go to Bacho Lanchang Market or, or, or Bukit um, Murtajam Market even, or any of the outer suburbs, all thriving. Thriving because they're supported by residents. So residence in your city is essential. The second one, and this is, I, we take lessons here from ecology and ecosystems, is an over-reliance on any single economic driver. And I'm not uh, pick, at all picking bones with tourism, at all. It's a very important part of the Penang's economy, and, and what YB said there just now is you know, exactly what needs to be done. But um, we need diversity in our economic activities in the heritage site. Yeah? Um, and the last point, which is sort of uh, separate to all of those factors, is climate change. Yeah. 
we know about flooding, we know about extreme weather events, we know Georgetown's not as vulnerable as some other parts of the state, but it's certainly vulnerable to heat and it's vulnerable to flooding. So that's something we need to be thinking about and how we go about doing that. Um, so just as I uh, start to wrap up, I'll just come back to this idea of, of heritage as an enabler and just think about some emerging trends that are likely to happen. It's not, the gates are not going to suddenly open, there's going to be, you know, uh, 30 million visitors back to Malaysia again. That's just not going to happen, right? It's going to be gradual, it's going to be slow. It's going to be driven initially by regional tourism. It's going to be driven by Penangites. It's going to be driven by uh, people from elsewhere in the, in the, in the, in the nation. Right? Um, and those that do come from outside, it's going to be a bit of a headache. So they're going to want to stay longer and they're going to want more authentic experiences. And, they, and hopefully they're going to spend more money. So it's important that nations and countries and cities have sto good stories to tell and good places to visit. Right? So this is the key. And Malaysia, I've got to say, has an outstanding story to tell. And I'm going to tell you now, you're not telling it properly. Yeah? You have an incredible history. The Lengong Valley, two million years of human history. Yeah? There's, there's evidence of, um, of stone axes from Homo erectus in Lengong, just two hours from here. Uh, no, no, nobody knows about it. Pretty much. Huh? So, Gua Kapa, another story, looking at CMI there, another project coming up. Um, so, you're uniquely positioned to tell, to tell these stories. Huh? So, I'm going to conclude with five strategies that I suggest, I suggest for um, moving forward on the topic of revitalising and resetting culture, heritage and tourism in Penang. Number one, we need to expand our thinking. Huh? Beyond heritage assets and on how heritage assets are used. We need new content, we need new ideas and we need to diversify our economy and, and pull together the different parts of the economy. Right? From, we shouldn't be separating heritage and, and culture and hospitality from manufacturing and high tech. They can be intimately related in, in different ways. And this is an idea that we've, Think City and Penang Institute and Digital Penang have been pursuing through the Creative and Digital District that we've been promoting for the old CBD of Georgetown, which is hollowing out for reasons um, to do with disruption, uh, to do with the fact that the banking sector is being uh, disrupted, etc. So this is an idea we've put forth. How do we bring arts, culture, heritage and technology together? That's strategy number one. Strategy number two is we need to invest in authenticity and narratives uh, narratives is the word here, narratives um, of our key assets. So we need deeper, more authentic stories. Um, no disrespect, but I think less upside down museums and more uh, investment in things like uh, Fort Cornwallis, the museological components, the stories that get told there. And the larger story of confluence um, in not just Malaysia, but uh, not just Northern region, sorry, but in Malaysia as a whole. And related to this is num number three from on my list is that we need to think about Penang as a gateway to a much larger story. So we, yes, um, yes, of course, it's the state of Penang and yes, of course, we need to think about Penang as a state and the state government has certain levers that it can do, but we need to be thinking about a northern region perspective. Huh? How do you come in Penang and then go to Bujang Valley, Lengong Valley, Gua Kapa, Bulim, wherever else it might be and leverage off that? Hmm? And I think it needs to have a, a story and a, and a network of spaces that we promote, possibly, possibly by collaborating with our neighbours. Number four, uh, we need to repopulate the city centre. We need to repurpose old office buildings. We need to think about co-living. We need to reintroduce shop housing living. We need to rethink how we um, uh, think about the heritage site beyond any empty building just being another hotel or cafe. And lastly, climate change, climate adaptation, not just mitigation. We need upstream retention to address uh, flooding and we need to invest in trees and greening to address the heat island effect because no tourists are gonna to come to a place that they can't walk around and they're, and they're sweating. So on that note, I'll think I'll, I think my time's up. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matt, for sharing some of the statistics and the strategies for how we could revive our tourism post-pandemic. And I think because of your good job now, you are also extending to KL, I think City, I see you are doing some work in Kuala Lumpur as well. 
Now, the third speaker is, uh, of course, Dato Muhammad Suhaili, the CPO of Penang. I must mention here that when I was reading his CV, I was very impressed that he did his master's in Nanyang Technology University. Yeah? Not very many police officers would have, been done, would have done their master's there. So I was very impressed, Dato Bayati. <coughs> and I think you know, he is going to talk of a different security with what uh, Dato Yo talk of uh, security during the pandemic. His was a health security issues. I think that Suhaili might be coming, covering on a different aspect of security. The floor is yours. Thank you, Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Doctor, uh, for the introduction. I would like to take the opportunity to also thank the organizer for inviting me. Uh, and I would like to address it. I'm actually, I'm the only frontliner who actually been invited for this particular prestige uh, summit. Uh, since I got the invitation, I'm trying to fit in into the topic, try to be like a think tank, which is a very difficult thing to do. And I found out that uh, being a cop, being a policeman, we are more like a tank, not a think tank. So <laughs> I will tank my way through today. <laughs> well, um, it's very seldom that uh, PDRM is invited to deliberate in such a prestige uh, stage like this. Uh, but unfortunately, I think if you want to take uh, the definitions of uh, or the translations of Home Affairs Ministry, literally, to Bahasa Melayu, it will be Kementerian Rumah Tangga. And how can you correct your rumah tangga if the player is not invited? So I'm glad to be here today to share what we have found out, our experience managing COVID-19 and how Pinangite actually reacts to COVID-19 and try to relate that to tourism. I will not be able to talk about culture or heritage because that itself is a different uh, platform and um, that is not my strong forte. So, uh, yeah, yes, yet again, if I were to recollect how one promised resilience and sustainability if the current state of the public interest, that is their basic safety, are ignored. So, Policing has always been at the end of each socialization process so, the, so that if po public policy and security are put at the bottom of the hierarchy of needs and therefore the root causes of that social problem will never be addressed. So having said that, there's four sessions today that was held earlier and it is not too much to ask if inputs from Royal Malaysian Police on all that four scopes in being addressed as well. So I will not deliberate much on uh, why we are not solving much of the social problem. Uh, I just would like to take this stage to share our experience, my experience as a CPO. For, uh, for three months and 25 days today, and uh, managing crime and public safety as well. So the scenario is this. For the last 20 months, the country has been under lockdown. And through that time, we have seen there's a drop in crime, in property crime as well as violent crime. That is taking uh, the, uh, the, the yardstick given by Interpol. It has dropped to 22.7%. What it tells us that when you control movement, you are actually managing risk. Managing risk in the sense that you control the opportunity for the criminal to take advantage of, and you minimize the vulnerabilities, simply because more people are staying at home. There's no movement. So, that's why crime drops. As for violent crime, 
I'm sorry, I have no scientific data to actually correlate whether this is right or not, but this is what we see that the pressure and the hardship of life, even though violent crimes drop, but it does not drop significantly, it still happens in the society. So the hardship of life, perhaps that is one of the contributing factors why violent crime is still a concern. And another scenario is that we are fully aware, I think everybody knows that National Security Council is the main body that decides strategies on combating the virus. Well, I think everybody here has agreed, the initial stage is quite confusing. Uh, it's been flip-flopping from one procedure to the next. Well, to be fair, no one has experienced such a scale of crisis. You know, even America cannot get it right the first time. And eventually, things are getting stable. Uh, we managed to understand the virus well, and policy making is getting stabilized. Well, in Penang, in the context of Penangites, I have to say this. Penangites are more responsive and aware of the seriousness of the crisis. This, I say, taking into consideration how Penang Act responds to public announcement and actual uh, fact what's happening on the ground. For instance, when we expected uh, two weeks ago that there will be an influx of visitors coming into Penang, about 50,000, Penang Act decided to stay home and giving that space to the visitors. And for that, I'm glad traffic are not so bad, <laughs> less complain, and, uh, and even earlier, I think the crowd will agree with me, we are one of the few states that went into phase two, where dining in is allowed, but even the eateries doesn't allow customer in, they still do tapau. And uh, you can still find today, uh, Itri still doesn't want to take the chance. So on that score, thank you very much to all Penangites. To, again, um, what we did, as far as the police did, we found out that we need to work together with the rest of the frontliners as well as the other stakeholders. Um, when the first uh, announcement that um, the, the, the movement will be lifted, we call upon uh, hotel uh, industries and uh, tourist uh, industries to sit down with us, with the rest of the frontliners, to iron out what are the shortcomings, what are the problems that we will face. I think what we did is very much what the earlier speakers have mentioned is that do not work in silos. So we have done that without we realizing it. We also understand the de other department's goals and uh, their shortcomings. And that is where we try to fill that gap, try to work together. And um, next week or this week in particular, we will sit down again to find out what are our shortcomings so that we can share it with the players, with the industries, and how to improve it. I think that's the way forward, working, in this, working at this moment of uncertainty. That is to share what you have, to share what your shortcoming is, and all um, the strategy that you have. So, I have lined out actually a um, few strategy or things that we need to do during this uncertain time. Uh, that is clear direction. That is at a strategic level. Yes, we heard about striking a balance today between con conserving nature and modernity. It's easier said than done, but we need to do it at the ground level. That is what Tan Sri and Sheng said today, this morning, is to take it on the operational level. We have to work bottom up. If you work top bottom, it's not necessarily work be exercised on the ground. So that is one. 
transparency that is a must i think when the the new health minister came into office that the first thing he did he go out and mentioned to us that the only forward about it is telling the truth whether we are in the good position or we are in the bad position and i think two weeks ago he did mention he came out on the news again saying that though we have lifted up the control movement but we are still managing the crisis so he pleaded to all of us to keep on wearing masks and adhere to the basic SOPs. That is, I think, one of the critical things that we have to do. That's trans transparency. Uh, creativity and innovation, I think this has been mentioned in the much earlier uh, panelists. Uh, technology, I think many people have talked about it. Uh, one important thing is flexibility and maneuverability. Since this is something new, nobody has experienced it. We can set up rules, we can set up policies, but we also must be very flexible. Some of the policy just don't work, it just doesn't work. So you must be flexible enough and you must give a thought when you make that policy. Last but not least is people is to bring back trust and sense of believing that the hard time is over. I, I have a chance to meet up with uh, one, of the, one or two of the hotel uh, industry uh, people. They're having difficulty of bringing back or recruiting back their staffs. Some of them have found a new job, and some of them are just too scared to come back to, in the, to the industry, afraid that they'll be retrenched the next time the infection goes rooftop. So now I think this morning, um, I can't remember one of the panelists was saying about upskilling and reskilling of people. That is a must that we need to do. And I think another thing is about ownership. Ownership. They are the main players in the industry, making sure the industry works. But they do not own the industry. So the loyalty is not there. The reality is not there. So ownership, how do you make? They own it, they love it, they will take care of the industry. That is important. And um, all that, I think, falls into the four teams according to the Pinning 2030 version, I um, mean, uh, vision, sorry. The livability, economy, people, and a built environment. Well, gentlemen, ladies and gentlemen, uh, before I go off, I think my conclusion is this. We are very good in, in, in identifying our problems. We can list problem number one till not problem number 100, the weaknesses, things that need to be corrected. However, we always short in solving it or intervening in it. Time is moving and will, and will never stop for us. Yes, it does have slowed down on us during COVID-19 and many did not realize that in our eagerness, we shouldn't be bringing back the old habits when God Almighty has given us a chance to recap and reset our future. With that, I thank you. Thank you, thank you Dr. Suhaili and Tan Sri Michael. Yo, please take note, in future, we have to invite uh, people from PDRM wherever necessary. <laughs> And uh, also, thanks for all your points on flexibility, transparency, and uh, also clear strategy and direction. These are very important points for us to work together. Next, uh, we will move on to Datu Sri Dr. Anwar Fazal. Uh, he happens to be the husband of my teacher from MBS Penang. <laughs> so, uh, I've been in contact with him for a long time, and he's a well-known personality who doesn't need much introduction. Thank you very much, Dr. Yeah. I'd like to say uh, citizens of the universe, yeah? the children of Mother Earth, brothers and sisters, Asalaamu Alaikum. It's a joy to be here with so many diverse people thinking about so many diverse issues in a very caring way. 
I also use that starting point because we must never forget, we must never forget the history of Penang, of a place that was nearly empty, but where people came from all parts of the world. And people came here for, as slaves, people came here as refugees, people came here for business opportunities, an amazing mix of people from all over the world. And if you were writing a book about the history and drawing a map and seeing how people moved in, whether it's the Parsi story, the Armenian story, the Jewish story, the German story, and, and again, don't say just British, you know, talk about the Irish differently because the Scottish and some of them don't like each other, you know, the English, um, and you had Within the Chinese itself, we have this terrible, uh, you know, kind of description, like as if they are one people. Huh? The diversity among the Chinese, every Kongsi in Penang, in every clan association, different kinds of things. Some of them can't even talk to each other here. Yeah? And, and so the diversity within the Chinese itself, and then you talk about India. I mean, it's a country with nearly a thousand languages, eh? and then people can come from the north, the south, the east, the west, eh? and, and just an amazing diversity within each of those communities. And if you realize that, that we are a place which saw so many unusual people for all over the world with so many reasons, and that, you can say that dynamism and that mix, that roja, you know, that persombor yeah, here, uh, is, is really continuing as something that is so central to Penang. And if we talk about our legacy, our history, it is this very strong, very strong feeling of a global community, a, a spirit of community that is so diverse, uh, completely diverse that, uh, that we can appreciate it so differently. A very early English governor who came here nearly 200 years ago, one of the first things he said, I have never seen any place in the world that has so many colors and creeds and, you know, uh, people in, in, in they just never ever seen the life. And I think that you can see that being reflected if you walk the streets of Penang. Uh, having been uh, somebody who's had 80 years uh, of having to experience uh, Malaysia and Penang in all these different faces, uh, right down from using the can with the string as your telephone, you know, to learning how to dial with the phone and, uh, and then having the first fax machine in Penang, apart from the government and the multinational corporations. Even the university used my fax machine. It was owned by a citizens' uh, organization, the Consumers International in Penang. Because to us, right down from very early, uh, as you grow up in heritage, being linked up with the new technologies was very important. It was in 18, 1987 that I had internet. And to get connection to internet, I had to dial to Australia or to UK. Can you imagine yeah, that uh, if you wanted that connect? Now, of course, anyone, anytime, anywhere can be done. And for us, globally, because we have this uh, diversity, one of the single most important things is to, is to remember our history and our legacy in many faces. I like to start, for example, that one great woman travel writer over a hundred years ago, I think in 1863 or 73. Her name was Isabella Bird, and she wrote a book called The Golden Chesonis and the Way Thither. And what did she say about Penang? A brilliant place under a brilliant sky. Isn't that a wonderful description? A brilliant place under a brilliant sky. And that's the kind of feeling that when people came to a place that's an island with hills and with sea and sunrise and sunset, and you look at uh, you know, 360 degrees, you see infinity here. Yeah? It's, it just was so special, just the feeling of coming to the place. Uh, I organized, uh, I think now about 250 conferences and uh, workshops for people from all over the world. And one of the other things that were very interesting, and I think the CPO will be interested, number of visitors who came here, well, you, say, you know, and one of the things I noticed is that I don't see a policeman, you know. 
because people were so used to places where crime is so uh, you know, prevalent and that there are people there looking very aggressive, you know, and uh, walking around. Here, yeah, no, there was a certain gentleness and openness and freedom, and, and that also gave Penang that kind of reputation uh, as a place of uh, great harmony. And because we are that special, the president of India, the late president Abdul Kalam, he visited Penang, he received an honorary doctorate from uh, USM, and I was asked to take him for a tour of the city. And during that tour, he walked, and when he finished the tour, you know what he says? Penang is a school for the whole world, for its humanity and connectivity. Yeah? A school for the whole of humanity, and that's what he said. And when he went back, can you imagine the president of India wrote a poem, which is nearly two pages long, about Penang and the great city of harmony. Yeah? And this is the president. It's a wonderful poem which uh, we are planning to put up in all the different languages uh, along the streets of Penang so people can remember uh, this very special poem and a very special person that, uh, that gave this. And this harmony is an asset that we should begin to recognize and also to celebrate. And as uh, I think one of the speakers earlier said, we, don't, we very often just get ourselves resigned to, resigned to the good things. We must celebrate them, we must remind them because success spurs other success, success spurs inspiration. Yeah? And so as, as the setup, for example, of the Harmony Center in uh, Penang, uh, YB Chung is uh, not here, but it's a very interesting uh, 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 setup now in order to work towards harmony. Uh, we have a global ethic project, you just have to look at uh, that Penang was the one of the only cities uh, independently that took the, all the different religions and had an exhibition and explanation with children doing colors and you know, doing um, symbols of different kinds of things and learning about commonality, about the wonderful golden principle uh, that is treat other people like you would like to be treated. Huh? And that's the golden rule eh, that's present in all kinds of different uh, religions. And one of the things now is that harmony now must become one of the assets on which we, we could provide leadership for the whole world. Eh? There's a whole world parliament of religions. There's a world harmony week. Eh? There's International Peace Day. Many of these things can become that, and we can become even a city of compassion. No? There's a charter of compassion, and these are kinds of things that Penang, this is history, has, uh, has, has got this. So that's one important uh, area of work that I think we should uh, celebrate as this. Our, the, you can say if there's anything in our heritage, in our culture, it's this harmony that we can share with the rest of the world. The other thing that um, uh, I would like to start off with also is that a lot of the chatting that we have about Penang very often gets trapped on the island. And that we sadly often disconnect with Sibrang Prai. And very often, oh, you're from Penang. No, no, I'm from Sibrang Prai. You know, people get used to uh, that kind of mindset, you know. And I think we, we need a, a feeling now of uh, looking at Sabrang Prai uh, in a different kind of way. One of the things, for example, we need now, we need to set up a world archaeological center because Sabrang Prai is now one of the world's leading places on archaeology. Can you imagine that? They found graves that go back to thousands of years where the grave is buried in shells. Yeah? And they have found now different kinds of elements uh, in the place that we have a history, an archaeological history is just, just so remarkable just across uh, in, in that place. So a global archaeological center and we can become something very special. And I hope that's again one of the things that we'll remember, will remind people about our very special 
origins no, of how we are a kind of place where we, people say where monsoons meet, you know, the airs, the winds, and people came here and went up. And Sibrang Pra is also very special. I mean, what was Penang's most well-known international product that's over a hundred years ago? Anybody likes to suggest? And it came from Sibrang. Lingam's chili sauce. People will laugh and say, my God, I mean, Lingam's chili sauce, which was packed in secondhand, you know, recycled bottles of Lee and Paring sauce, you know, which was the most famous English sauce. This little entrepreneur in Bathworth yeah, bought all these secondhand, second bottles, recycled bottles, and he made his chili sauce and put that, and his brand was the Lingam sauce. And it moved to all over the world. And then, of course, he, uh, a new entrepreneur took over from this uh, founder, and it became a global product. And it became the first, you can say, Benang's product that really went global. And now you can find it in 20 over countries huh, that you will actually find. And you can ask somewhere, you know, I want a lingam chili sauce, have you had it? And they still keep the same bottle of heritage that's like the Lee and Paring sauce bottle, but it's straight, straight, yeah, in the place. And you can go to supermarkets now, and of course it's, now you get, get lingam chili sauce with onions or, you know, with garlic and all kinds of different uh, varieties. And Sibrang Prai, not only is archeological, uh, there's a whole lot of history of, uh, of, uh, e of ecology in that place, the, the mountains, the hills, uh, you know, the, the, the culture, one of the top 10 festivals in the world, huh? top 10 festivals in the whole world is actually from Patiwath, like in, in, uh, from Bukit Martajam, yeah? the St. Anne's, uh, the cathedral, the French, the, 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 uh, uh, the St. Anne's feast, yeah? that's what they call it, yeah? in the place and they sell one of the 10 top festivals in the whole of the world and 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 then you find the earliest stone with writing you know, that believes to that even goes to Sanskrit or before in the compound and it's called the Chirok Tukun stone yeah? very few people have even known it and it was a very early marked heritage site by the Malaysian government yeah? Long before we talked about Georgetown or Biosphere, you know, very, very early, uh, that was the first heritage place in Penang that was, uh, that was marked out for, for, for that. And extremely important to remember. And actually, if you take the highway, they actually have a board which says that uh, you can go and go to Tukun. Yeah? And, and nobody thinks why yeah? uh, at all because we get so disconnected. You know? There's, of course, a bird museum. And now, interestingly, uh, we, there, are, there are groups that are now developing. Can you imagine? Can you imagine? We don't have a Georgetown channel, but we have a Sabrang Prai channel. A video program, you know, that has got already 400 over videos. Why? One young man by the name of Jaffa, an entrepreneur, decided, I am going to start the Sabrang Pai channel. I'm not going to get permission from the, uh, you know, Multimedia Commission or anybody else. I'm just going to start the channel and I'm going to put it on, uh, you know, on the internet. To... And, and amazing, I mean, you I'm start your own TV channel. No? And so it's Sabrang the Sibrang Pry channel. You can Google it, you know, and uh, Jaffa is just an amazing person. He does his own narr narration. And what he does is something, again, that people in heritage forget, and that is to celebrate all the little, little golden gems that are there you know, in different places, and he tells the story of each of these uh, places. Now, also, there's a movement to, for walks. Huh? Walking and cycling is becoming a, a more and more significant uh, uh, area of uh, mobility. And so, you know, a hundred kinds of walks that you can do both in Sabrang Prai and in, in, in Penang on the island itself. And I think walking is a huge thing that many often, very often tourists now also are saying, I mean, I just, I want to walk. Can you tell me some things that I can do where I can explore nature? Yeah, and then we, we are very special because we had our national park before. We have still beaches that are key. All 
compact huh? and we have the special compactness uh, in the place. So the other thing that we have in, uh, in, uh, in there, yes, is, is, is the name of a drink, I thought, no? Time out. <laughs> uh, so we, we have a legacy, a, a book legacy. Huh? We have produced more books here in Penang than uh, you can say, you know, uh, the last 200 years itself. So literacy is again another, another spank. So the spirit of Penang, the spirit of Penang is amazing. Yeah? And, and I think we have many, many areas in which we can, we can go. Let us celebrate people, places, and passions of Penang. Uh, I am just starting and I'm looking forward to some partners called Penangpedia. Yeah? That means a gateway to know everything you need to, Penang, to, do, to know about Penang. And we've done the first draft called This Day in Penang's History. And the idea is later you just say, aha, this day something happened in Penang, you know, which is very interesting. All the books on Penang, all the films on Penang, all the cards through one little outlet. And I, and I feel Penang has got such a beautiful identity that something like this is uh, essential and I'm looking forward to people who would be cooperating. I'll be cooperating with the Penang Institute. I'll be, hopefully, Wabasan Open University will also be interested. And I think all those who are in the digital area yeah, would be interested because you, we want school children and young people to be engaged because if we are going to have a future, and that's my last comment, the journey in the future is not a destination. It's a journey we take and we will engage the young people together with this journey. And if we do them, we will have a great future. Thank you very much. In the song. Thank you, Dr. Sri, Dr. Anwar Faisal. Uh, it's nice to hear your story, but unfortunately, time prevents us from here. You took us through a nice uh, storytelling of the history and the diversity of Penang. Thank you very much. And next, we have uh, Dato. To Chin Leong from IJM, who is also the immediate past president of RADA. Well, the good thing about uh, online seminar, online webinar, you can actually mute the mic of the speaker. <laughs> okay, here comes the developer. Uh, some of you may be wondering why we need a developer here talking about culture, heritage, you know, and uh, tourism. I, and I find it very strange before every time, you know, when there's a developer talking, all the YB starts to show up. Uh, we have YB Yo here, Nato Halim there, YB Chong Eng, YB Lim Siu King, all starts to show up. I don't know why. Is this a plan from the organizer when the developers start talking? Um, anyway, um, if you look at the corporate sponsor, three out of four are developers, so I know I will at least have some support from the floor. Okay, um, why we are here? Uh, developers, I, I look at, we look at developers as also one of the major investors to the state, uh, other than the MNCs from the uh, semiconductor industry. We invested millions, millions and ringgit in the state. We provide jobs, we build public amenities, we build infrastructure, we build all the houses, all the institutions. So today, uh, I think that we can, uh, as developer, we can share a little bit about uh, what we observe uh, in Penang, uh, the culture, the heritage, uh, the UNESCO site, uh, what we can uh, contribute, how we can come in to help, what suggestions we can give. Okay. Now, from the uh, perspective of a developer, we need to look at Penang holistically when we talk about culture and heritage. And tourism plays an important role in the entire ecosystem. Penang consists of the island and mainland. You know, if you talk about tourism, the island is exactly like Hong Kong, the Hong Kong island, you know, Hong Kong, and then mainland is like Kowloon. Now, being an island, I mean, when we look at tourism, 
the most precious thing of the island is your shoreline. If you go around the world, any city you know, that has a good shoreline, they capitalize on the shoreline. Uh, we go to, uh, let's say you go to Hong Kong, the Avenue of Stars. You look at all the beautiful buildings, all the prominent. Sydney Darling Harbour, right? Um, integrated waterfront development. We look at um, San Francisco, Fisherman Wharf, even Singapore, the Fullerton area, overlooking Marina Bay Sands, Garden by the Bay. And also, we feel that Penang today, we still do not capitalize on the waterfront, the shoreline. Uh, we do not have one major integrated development for tourism. Uh, this is what we think that you know, Penang, we need to start uh, looking at this. And um, in Sebrang, in fact, we, we see many beautiful spots can go under ecotourism, but the surrounding areas of those spots and uh, the, the, the connectivity is still you know, um, not up, up to the expectation. We still need to improve a lot. Okay, firstly, we need to actually have a comprehensive town planning blueprint. That's how, when we look from a developer's point of view, the entire Penang, you know, when we look at this town planning blueprint, besides affordable housing, we need to define where is the tourism belt. Most people will put it at the waterfront. We need to define where is the financial district so we can inject more broad ratio commercial development into our financial district. We need look, to look at where is the housing area for the local community, sports and recreation, uh, recreation facilities, public transport hub, green parks, etc. So we need that big blueprint, long term plan for Penang. That's how we feel. And when we have this plan, we, we need to really stay the cost. Uh, you look at Singapore, they come up with township, waterfront, financial district, uh, tourism belt, and then they, they stay the cost. We cannot, um, once in a while, we see a project suddenly pop up, you know, in the middle of nowhere, did not fit into the plan. So we need to stay the cost. We cannot approve projects and development haphazardly, you know, that doesn't fit the plan. Uh, besides store planning, from our point of view, we need to start looking at our connectivity. Connectivity is sustainability. Before the pandemic, well, our tourism was so good until Penang Nights actually worried about our traffic. You know, we don't want to get out during weekends. You don't want to go to Butterfringi during weekends. You know, you, you get into the jam all the way up and all the way down, right? So we, we talk about many, many plans. You know? We talk about Ayatam Bypass, Teropahang Bypass, Water Taxi, SkyCap, LRT. Are we still working on this plan? When are they coming? Independent tourists today that come to Penang, they rely on grabs, rapid, the buses, you know? So what? else you know when we go to, to, to connectivity is very important for tourists uh, for tourism uh, when they get here the tourists do not want to get into jams they don't want to spend a lot of time moving from one spot to one the another spot you go to bangkok you get into the jam you know jakarta you get into the jam <laughs> you know but of course bangkok have the best the most efficient public transport is the tutut uh, so so we we need to look at it we, we penang can actually look at uh, the inner city Right, how we can create some public transport. Maybe we get in the electric mini vans, go shuttling around the city centre, free for the tourists, free for the locals, just within the city centre, we can you know, uh, look at uh, scooter rentals, we can look at park and ride. You know, we can develop this plan. Okay. So when we talk about tourism of Penang, uh, rather... You know, we, we have Kaloxi, one spot, we have uh, Escape, we have uh, Padang Kota, the Fort Convalis, uh, we have uh, uh, Butterfly Farm, 
But in fact, the most important site for, for Penang tourism is the UNESCO Heritage Site. Right. And this is one of the biggest UNESCO sites in the world. This is more than 650 acres of UNESCO site. So Georgetown itself encompasses almost all the culture and heritage of Penang. But today, we see that the population of Georgetown is reducing by the day. Okay, uh, we see that all the old trades are diminishing. I think the local council, the state government, they know the challenges. The, because of the UNESCO guideline, very stringent. So the house owner, the, the, the house owner or developers who wants to come in and restore the houses or redevelop some pockets of land, the cost is very high. Right? The restoration cost is very high. So if you want to come up with that money, we need to get high rental. But to get high rental sometimes is almost impossible because they are so restrictive. Okay? Today, if I move my office into the, one of the shop houses in, in the heritage zone, as a boss, I don't have a car park. All the staff that come to work with me don't have car parks. If I open a restaurant, where my customers are going to park? Right? So, so these are all the issues that we have to look at. We have to work together. How to bring people. Basically, what we are saying there is to repopulate Georgetown. How can we continue to nurture the, the, the culture and heritage of Georgetown in Georgetown? This is, this is very important. Well, time is up. Um, what, what we can actually, uh, RADA is trying to do is we, we want to tell the state government, the policy makers, uh, please get us involved. We can help. We can, uh, we can contribute. Uh, we, can, uh, we hope that the, the, the policy can be a bit more flexible. We can be more focused. Uh, like recently, I, I'm very excited about the initiative by our Dato Banda, the mayor. He was talking about why don't we create a uh, city campus, Georgetown University. I said, that's great. He said, we, we can upgrade all the backlinks, use the backlinks as the connector, we, using all the parks, using all the heritage houses as lecture halls. So we bring community back into, into city centre. So when the, 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 the universities, communities are back into the city centre, all the other trades and businesses will follow. I think this is a brilliant idea. Right? So Reda can come in to help, Reda can come in to contribute ideas. If the government is ready to give some flexibility, give some incentive, we can work together, we can repopulate uh, Georgetown, all right? And uh, hopefully we can help the uh, tourism. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dato To Chin Leong, uh, for your comments about how developers in the state can work together to promote tourism. Next, we have uh, Ms. Ku Salma Nazution, who received her Lifetime Achievement Award this morning. During my trips to Penang, a stop at her bookshop is always a must for me. She creates a great job of developing historical books and information about Penang. So without much further ado, I'll call upon Ms. Ku Salma, who is joining us virtually. Uh, thank you Ms. Ku Salma, you the floor is yours. Okay, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Can? Okay. Uh, I'm yes, going to share can. a PowerPoint. I, I, first of all, I would uh, like to uh, humbly thank, you know, all those who are responsible for this uh, Lifetime Achievement Award. And I'm very, very grateful and uh, uh, appreciative. Thank you very much. Okay, so I would like to talk about uh, heritage in a very broad sense, okay, and also about biodiversity in, in this talk. First, we start with a Georgetown World Heritage Site. Uh, I think you all know about it. We have a great waterfront, right? And uh, the during the pandemic, you know, a lot of businesses suffered. So it's very difficult to upkeep the buildings. So we have to think about it uh, in the long term. What are we going to do about this? I know we have 
a lot of problems with the pandemic, but this is something that also needs attention. Okay, delving into local history, cultural identity, and intangible cultural heritage is something that we have done beyond, uh, you know, just thinking about the physical building. So it gives us a great sense of pride and cult uh, and, and a sense of belonging. So Penangites everywhere in the world remain connected to their hometown, you know? Sure, it attracts uh, tourists who come to enjoy Penang food and they take selfies and it's very Instagram worthy. It also attracts the right kind of talent here and it helps to brand the city. So uh, there are still sites outside of Georgetown, for example, the judge's residence at uh, One Sepoy Lines. It's a 19th century residence of the governor of the street settlements whenever he visited Penang. Now that we have a state heritage commissioner, so we hope that uh, people, you know, the, the government will also start looking into sites like this. And we're really proud of the inscription of Penang Hill and um, also the, the National Park. And we hope that this will spur an alternative visioning for the hill. Uh, so mass tourism, as you know, may actually burden a fragile ecosystem. So how about leasing out, you know, a site for an artist colony? You know, imagine all the paintings, the poems, the creative works that would be generated by the artists themselves. Um, this is a map that I made of, you know, the sites relevant to UNESCO on the island. And I've superimposed on it, the Penang Transport Master Plan. As you can see, you know, one of the highways would actually run through that kind of the Man and Biosphere uh, Park, uh, Man, Man and Biosphere area. And, um, you must remember that we are in a water scarce state where all our water resources are very precious. Okay, so, and then the other place that I've marked in green is actually uh, Pulau Jiraja, which was um, identified for nomination to UNESCO uh, because of the importance of its history as a leprosy colony. So it was supposed to pair with Sungai Bulo, but Sungai Bulo went ahead and Penang decided not to participate. So to me, it's a lost opportunity. Uh, Jiraja was also a former quarantine station and a medical center for infectious diseases. So can you imagine that this could be, you know, another quarantine area? Because it may not be the last pandemic. But when there's no pandemic, it would be great as, you know, a place for team building and all that. So it's also next to the largest seagrass area in, in Malaysia, and that's around the Middle Bank. Okay, where do you think this is? It's not Batu Fringi. It's actually Tlok Kumba. You know, I, I don't think that many people really know how, how beautiful the place is. It's a bay, it's between the two lakes of the turtle. It's an area that's teeming with fish, prawns, crabs. It's visited by turtles and dolphins. And uh, okay, this is a, a video. There's been, been many videos made by a very talented videographer, Andrew Han. And this is something that he made in Hokkien. Uh, so, you, you know, the local fishermen just cannot understand why development has to take place in a place where they have fished for generations. So the story of Haji Zakaria resonates very well with Penangites, and we have collected almost 400,000 signatures through two petitions uh, to say that, no, we don't want Penang South Reclamation. Uh, climate emergency is demanding that we help to build resilient community, and we need to take into account environmental, social, and corporate governance factors when we look at risk and opportunity. It's now the 21st century, you know, it's, it's, it's an age of climate crisis. Okay, what about Sprung Pai? Actually, you know what? Sprung Pai local plan has identified 16 exist, existing industrial parks to be upgraded and 2,500 hectares or 6,000 acres of land, mainly old palm oil plantation earmarked for industrial expansion. So I'm not against development. I'm not against industrial expansion. In fact, many top industries are locating themselves in, in, in Batu Kawan. It shows that they don't need to be, you know, they don't need to have a beachfront, right? Because they're, they're doing manufacturing. And in Sabrang Prai, you have the paddy fields and the, in the midst of the beautiful paddy fields, you have the Gua Kepa Neolithic Shell Midden burial site. And you have one of the biggest stretches of mangrove uh, just north of Batworth. And there will be another proposed reclaimed area there. But that is a very famous international bird and biodiversity area. It's a spawning ground for fish. And, you know, I mean, um, the, the, the bird watchers coming from all over the world. You know, in, in Hong Kong, I think they have, I don't know how many thousands and thousands every time there's a, there's a season, you know. So we, ha we have to be cognizant of the limits to tourism. 
okay, we have a pandemic that gives us a shock, but we also now have increasing wealth inequality, which means you have a shrinking middle class, okay? And uh, that means that, you know, we have to think more about uh, excursion tourism because international travel restrictions will come on and off. And definitely you'll be thinking twice about traveling because you don't want to get, catch COVID in a foreign country where you have to pay medical bills, right? On the other hand, those who have recovered from COVID have natural immunity and they should have more freedom to travel and they can also be the frontliners of the tourism industry. You know, that's, uh, I think, very rational thinking. And um, COVID pandemic has not been kind to cruise ship tourism. Local residents in many cities like Venice are actually happy about reduction of cruise ships. You know, it's very uh, uh, em emitting a lot of carbon pollution. So they realize that it, it makes a lot of money for the operators, but compared to, you know, the burden to the city is just not worth it. So I hope that we're not going that way, okay? Now, this is about, uh, there's a very uh, brilliant uh, young Stanford mathematician from Penang who attracted world attention for this modeling of basic reproduction number or R naught of the COVID spread. And it shows that the Penang workplace cluster contributed to 70% of COVID cases, uh, early June to mid July, because factories and foreign worker dormitories are actually one ecosystem. Unfortunately, the MCO affects everyone, including the tourism industry. And it, got, it just goes to the measure, uh, it just goes to show that the measures taken by government are not sufficiently targeted. So we cannot just, you know, follow things. I mean, I mean, like maybe what they're doing in the West, we cannot follow what they're doing blindly. We have to think for ourselves what we can do differently. Okay, we learn from experience. As you know, air conditioned indoor environments like factories and offices are ideal for COVID spread. So what do we do? Okay, we have to build our design, our environment differently. So we need actually less lockdowns and more active lifestyle and more sunshine. You know, the, this is from uh, Paris, okay? The Paris mayor is imagining the city as a garden and every neighborhood should be full of trees, cyclists, pedestrians, children should be playing in the street. Do you know that since the COVID pandemic started, the average IQ of children up to three years old has dropped by 22 points. That means the average IQ of children in one study is now 78. Why? Because they don't see faces, they don't see environment, they don't go out. I mean, just think about, you know, how we're doing things and what, how it's affecting the children. So uh, this is a very famous kind of transport pyramid. Of course, we should be doing more walking, cycling, public transport. And then the last priority is cars. So how do we make this uh, flip, you know, flip the transport pyramid? Well, transport disruption is coming because the ideal city for many young professionals is a 15 minute walkable city. Our, our cars are parked 95% of the time and in the near, near future, most people won't even own private vehicles. So we don't need to spend billions on highways, okay? Smart city means smart transport. Okay, this is uh, some slides of the five foot way program that I spearheaded as a city councillor a few years ago. Um, and this is a, a, a game, okay. Uh, just a suggestion that there are many ways to decongest the city. One is, you know, like the traffic system or even system. So what we need is not a total lockdown, but we need kind of to decongest and to, you know, make social distancing possible. So there are many ways we have to think out of the box. Okay, this picture just reminds me of how it used to be. In Gurney Drive, everything was jam-packed, all the hawkers on the street, and then people decided to clean up. But we, I think we threw out the baby with the bath water, you know? And we actually, now we should actually go back to the streets, food on the street, but you provide sanitation, uh, you know, cleaning facilities. It can be that, like this, you know, not so crowded, but people will enjoy eating outside. Okay. So last, this is my last slide, and I'm talking about biodiversity in the backyard. Apart from medical tourism, people are now going for health tourism. They want to build up the natural immunity. They want the outdoors. And Urban biodiversity is going to be very important together, side by side with cultural diversity. And this place makes the place more livable. It attracts talent, which you need for manufacturing industry. So this is one of the factors of quality of life that we need, we expect, and we shouldn't let, you know, the things get us down. We must uh, re re reset, reset and think of new paradigms in the future ahead. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh...
Ku Salma for your very passionate conservative uh, or maintaining the conserv conserv conservationist attitude, you know. It's always a challenge, conservatism versus uh, conser con conservation versus uh, development. It's very conflicting. The only consolation that we have with this is that we have done much better than Singapore in this area. So we, we learned the lesson where Singapore destroyed a lot of its old heritage areas, then they realized it was too late, but Penang woke up much earlier, and thankfully we are now uh, one of the UNESCO heritage cities. Now, the, thank you very much. Uh, let's give another round of applause to Ku Salma, please. The last uh, speaker is uh, Mr. Cheng Hak Peng, and being the last speaker, you have the greatest pleasure YB Dato Abdul Halim is already here. We want him to, so we'll give you the floor now. It's good being the last speaker because I can speak very fast, you know, because then, okay, uh, I've decided not to use any of my slides, okay? We just forgo with the slides. That suits everyone, right? See, Dato Suhaili, you're happy, right? So the police won't catch me. I. Okay, uh, why, do I forgo, why do I want to forgo all the slides? Because I just want to speak freestyle from the bottom of my heart of what I have learned today and all from the colleagues and everything, right? Uh, as you know, I represent ATAP, the Association of Tourism Attractions Penang. We were the first one hit and the first one, the last one out. Actually, when borders are open, then only we got a little bit of business out of 18 months. 20% uh, of my members are, have ceased operation, have closed down. Uh, another 40, 50 percent went into hibernation until recently came out. Uh, thousands of jobs are lost, you know. Uh, families are in hungry, hungered. But anyway, there's always hope, right? Today, uh, what have I learned through this morning? Tan Sri Andrew Sheng said, collective action trap. That is one very good term. Collective action trap means that it's a shared value. If we all, Penang Knights, from the top, from the authority, from the students, from the academy, from Ting Tang, from properties, from everyone, if we can't come and work together and we keep blaming others, then it's going to be round and round and round and it's going to be in the circle again. You see, Penang has a lot to offer. That's why we are, have two UNESCO status, right? Uh, Dr. Matt Benson mentioned, you know, we, we have a lot. But the problem is we don't know how to share the story. You see, that's a waste. If you don't, if you have a story and you don't know how to share, then it's really zero. You know why is Penang unique? Why tourists are travelling nowadays? When the borders are reopened, tourism is one of the most important one, right? When we say tourism, it means arts, antiques, uh, culture, heritage, medical education, property, when it comes to reinvesting, everything is there. One thing important about tourism, why we need to open up tourism very fast. I spoke to Dato Suhaili uh, when he first came into office. Tourism needs to open because it's cash. It's very simple. Once the borders are open, the, the, the visitors come in, they start spending. Once they start spending, the domino effect starts. When the domino effect starts, the flow of money starts going down. So everyone starts spending, everyone starts working, everyone starts selling. That's how everything works. If you close the borders, nothing works. These two weekends, when state borders were, were, are open, many of you in the industry can sense that there is hope. And there's, there are hopes now. You know, just by looking at my own shop, Gi Hyang, for the past donkey months, you know, when we had meetings after meetings, it's always KPI, why not reach, why not reach KPI, KPI, you know. Last, last week in, in my head of department meetings, one of my retail managers said we are out of biscuits. And I didn't, I didn't recall that, I didn't, I didn't get that, you know, until five minutes later I came back to her and said, what, what, what did you say just now? You're out of biscuit? Why, no workers or any raw material problem? No, they said, too many visitors came in at one go. You see, so what we need for Penang now is people to come back. 
If we need people to come back, we need all Penang Knights to have the same heart. If you are saying Penang is no good and you have a citizenship or a PR or an intention to migrate, then good luck, go ahead. You know? But this is a place I call home. And if you call home, then let us come together and promote this together from bottom up and from up to down. It has to be collective. It has to be shared value. You know, it can't be only the politician or the policy maker up there, Shok Sandiri. Uh, not saying you guys, okay? <laughs> right? But it's true. It's true. You know, you can't just say Shok Sandiri up there and then you turn later here, you turn later there, and then we die down here, which is wrong. You see, what you want is to have a good economy, a safe society, right? For people to dare to come out and visit, talent, talents there to come in and invest in us. That's what today's reinventing, reinvention is all about. Another word I learned just now was ownership, which I said, you know, if you are in Penang and you can't love Penang, you can't share the story of Penang, then why are you in Penang? Klang is better. Dato Sri Nazir Arif just now said, you know, Klang is better than Penang, you know, because the government started over there first, you know. So if we are to here to stay and to develop this small little tiny island plus pry, <laughs> see, I catch up very fast, you know. We can do it. We have a lot of story in terms of history, culture, arts, antiques, you know, but always antiques are missed. We preserve the heritage building, but we are not preserving the things inside, the arts, the antiques. We are preserving some of the old traits. But what about antiques? See, that's very important. What tourists, wants, what tourists now comes to Penang or comes to a place is because of unique experience. They are not coming here for the high towers. They are not coming here for the Adidas, the Nikes, the Hermes, you know. They are coming here for what Penang can offer that other states, other countries cannot offer. And that is what Penang. So one suggestion that I think should start is that it should start with education. If we can't invest in education and let the kids know how good is Penang, how prosperous is Penang, how exciting is Penang, when you grow up, when our kids grow up, you know, they will think that Australia is better than Penang. For sure. Right? This is for sure. So that's why I'm proud to say that my, my two kids in, is in uni, finishing up their course, and they're happy to say that we are coming back. You see? So that's what we want for Penang. We want them to come back. We want foreign talent to come in. So only then the whole thing can start in terms of tourism, manufacturing, which are the two largest sectors in Penang. So ladies and gentlemen, I think I forgo my speech and I went freestyle. Good or bad, it's below eight minutes. You don't have to do, uh, listen to the ding again, right? Dato Halim will be up here to, to speak for the last, for the conclusion. So ladies and gentlemen, let's make Penang a place, a must place for the world tourists and investor, a place to visit, to live, to tour, to seek education and to seek medical help. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Chung Hak Ting. Thank you, Mr. Chung. Uh, we empathize with the challenges you faced in your industry as well as in this conference. So. Hopefully everything will come to a good end and you will be able to perform much better from now on. With that, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we'll forego the question and answer session. Please give a round of applause to all our presenters today. Thank you.